Recently, we talked about where ASL came from and how it developed. And you can't study the history of ASL without studying the history of deaf education. So let's review and talk a little about these four guys. First, up here in the upper left-hand corner was Abe de la P. He was considered the father of the deaf because he started the first school for the deaf. He was hearing, but he recognized the power of sign language and how it could be used to connect um, deaf people with language. And so he used sign language, I mean, with, with written language. So he used sign language to help them learn to read and write. One of his star pupils was Jean Massou. He was the first teacher of the deaf who was himself deaf, not just in America, but ev anywhere in the world, anywhere in recorded history. And De La Pie's philosophy about teaching deaf children involved what we call manualism or the use of sign language. And it was also known as the French method because he was the one who kind of made that popular and first used that in the teaching of deaf children. Um, his opponent, at that time was Samuel Heineke, who's not pictured here, uh, but he believed in oralism, the use of speech and lip reading uh, to, for deaf people to communicate. So because Heineke supported that, it became known as the German method, and those labels will come back later. Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet is here in that lower left-hand corner. Um, he started the first school for the deaf in America, inspired after meeting little Alice Cogswell, who lived across the street and was deaf. And he convinced Laurent Clare to leave the school in Paris, where he had grown up and was now teaching, and to help him start the first school for the deaf. And that's, uh, we're, we're going to start our story today sort of where, they, where their story leaves off. The first school for the deaf in the U.S. was the American Asylum for the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut. And when you think of the word asylum, a lot of times people think like insane asylum. They think crazy people. But the word asylum actually means a safe place. People come to the U.S. all the time seeking political asylum or religious asylum because the country they come from is persecuting them or trying to kill them, and they are looking for a safe place. But uh, the school was started in 1817, as we mentioned, by Topkin, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet and Laurent Clare. Gallaudet and Claire continued De La Pie and Seacard's tradition of openness in their techniques and a willingness to train other people. So after the success of the American Asylum, other schools were opened in other states, uh, including the Texas School for the Deaf, which opened in 1857 with four students. Now, I want to read for you. One of those early students was a young lady named Emily Lewis. She recorded, years later, kind of recorded her thoughts on those early days of the Texas School for the Deaf. So I'm just going to read just a little bit of this to you. This is from A Brief History of the Texas School for the Deaf by Emily Lewis. No doubt you will like to know the beginning and early history of our school for the deaf, the pride of the Lone Star State. A deaf man by the name of Matthew Clark visited Austin in the fall of 1856. He inquired of the legislators if there was a school for the deaf in this state. They answered none, and then determined that, they should, that there should be an institution opened at once. The first schoolhouse was very small, having been used as a smokehouse by Dr. Jennings, owner of the place. The walls were unfinished and black with smoke, and the floor was rough and black with grease. There were some rafters above that used to hold bacon to be smoked. It was said that Dr. Jennings had many slaves whom he fed on bacon and cornbread. The yard was full of weeds and bushes, and no flowers were around the houses. The dwelling house was small and low, containing only two rooms, 15 by 15, and a hall, 15 by 8. During the Civil War, the matron, Mrs. Snyder, sheared sheep and carded wool and cotton and spun them into thread. Some of the large girls, meaning older girls, helped with the carding and spinning. The superintendent had two spinning wheels made for them to use. The matron taught them how to knit socks, stockings, mittens, gloves, and suspenders. Sometimes she sold the articles in order to get money with which to buy clothing for the girls. Conditions were difficult all over during the war, and the students had to use cheap tallow candles, which is basically burning fat, and the boys had to carry water from a stream. The matron was very careful and thoughtful. She herself, with the boys, worked in the garden, and so she and the officers, by their economy, saved the whole school from starvation. 
Most of the people's parents were too poor to afford to take them home during vacation, so they stayed at the institution for several years. They came at school in ox wagons and hacks and sometimes on horseback. Mr. Von Nostrad, who became the teacher, was not able himself to pay another teacher from the north, so the board appointed the writer, that's Emily talking to herself about herself, as teacher of the beginners in 1864. She did not get any salary for two years on account of the hard times. Uh, Emily later became the principal and she retired in 1914. Things might have started very simply, but the schools did grow. The picture you see here on this slide is of the Texas School for the Deaf as it grew into being. So it did not stay for students in a smokehouse. They were able to get better resources once the war was over and uh, conditions improved. For many years, deaf child, a deaf child was either sent away to a state boarding school, like the Texas School for the Deaf, or had to try to succeed in a regular public school without any extra help. If they didn't attend the state school, they had little or no access to sign language. There were no interpreters, no deaf ed teachers, no content mastery, no special ed, nothing, and no chance to even learn sign language, unless you knew, happen to know somebody who already knew it. Now, let's talk for a minute about Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, he was famous for invent inventing the telephone, but if you ever had the chance to ask him, Mr. Bell, what do you do for a living? He would have told you that he was an educator of the deaf. He believed that since we were living in a more enlightened and technologically advanced age, we could eradicate or get rid of deafness. We had the knowledge, technology, and skill to help them integrate into hearing society. He was also a eugenicist who believed that through purifying the gene pool, we could get rid of disease and birth defects. He didn't want deaf people to, have ch to marry and have children, uh, which is kind of misguided because now we know that only 8% of deaf children are born to deaf parents. Bell wasn't alone in his feelings about oralism. The Milan Conference, which is pictured down here on the right side of your screen, was convened in 1880. This was supposed to be a meeting of deaf educators from all over the world, coming together to make a decision about the future for deaf students. But that's not quite what happened. Edward Minor Gallaudet, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet's son, who started the first college for the deaf in the world, went to the convention, and when he got back, he published an article in the American Annals of the Deaf to share his findings. He wrote, It is well known that the management of the convention was in the hands of the promoters of articulation, meaning speech, and especially under the control of the representatives of the Pierre Society, an association established some years since in Paris for the pr purpose of securing the recognition of Mr. Pierre as the first teacher of deaf mutes in France, and to bring about the general adoption of the oral method, which was practiced by Pierre. Basically, they were trying to rewrite history and get rid of De La P. The formal utterances of the conference at Milan are to be no more taken as representing the sentiments of teachers of the deaf and dumb throughout the world than are the resolutions of a party nominating convention to be regarded as a fair expression of the opinions of the whole community. So what he's saying here is thinking that what these guys had to say represented everybody was like going to the Republican convention and thinking that represented every American. The writer of this article, again, he, he can't just say I, he has to refer to himself in the third person. The writer of this article opposed the use of either the German or the French method to the exclusion of the other and advocated a combined system in which all available means should be employed, those being wisely adapted to the diverse conditions of those who were being taught. If they told the world that they had banished signs, the records of the convention will testify against them, for it was strictly acknowledged that natural signs, those which are used and understood by hearing persons, might be employed in the earlier stages of instructions. I shall ask your consent to placing the simply deaf on one side, they wrote, and those deaf and otherwise afflicted on the other. In this latter case, I include those suffering from defective brain power, imperfect vision, extreme constitutional weakness, or serious malformation of the vocal and articulating organs. The first division is proposed to be instruction on the German method, the second one in French. So basically what they're saying was the Milan conference 
declared to the world that we would only be using speech in deaf schools, that there wouldn't be any sign language. And by the end of the conference, these guys were so fired up, they were on their feet yelling, long live speech, long live speech. I should mention there was exactly one deaf person in that crowd. Everybody else was hearing. So they did not have any, they didn't ask deaf people, hey, how do you think we should be educated? They said it would only be used speech. And that's what they declared to the world afterwards. But even their, in their own notes, it shows that they believed that there were some kids who could not be taught using speech, that, that they were never going to be successful trying to learn to talk and to read lips. So it said, oh, it's okay to teach them with sign language. But that's not what the, most of the people heard. So now I want to show you a painting. It's called The 3rd of May, 1808 by Spanish painter named Goya. These guys on the left try to throw a rebellion and the army on the right managed to round them up, take them out back and shoot them. Now I want to show you another version of this painting done by a deaf artist. It's called Milan, Italy, 1880. For many deaf people, it was if ASL was taken out back and executed. The Milan Conference was the start of the Dark Ages for ASL. Now, despite a zero tolerance policy for signing in schools, ASL managed to survive. Students taught each other in secret and the deaf community continued to use it. Many religious organizations embraced it as a clear form of communication. And uh, I hate to leave it there, kind of in the dark ages for ASL, but I promise we'll come back and finish this story uh, in the next day or two. Until then, happy signing.